Nearly everyone agrees that the economy will be one of the most important issues to them when they head into the voting booth this come November. And my next guest is working to make sure that young people in particular are represented in a major way in that discussion. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Comcast Newsmakers on the Vote. I'm Robert Trainum. Joining me is Matthew Siegel, founder of the group OurTime.org. Matthew, welcome back to the program. Good to be here, it's Robert. It's good to see you. Yeah, I want to talk about the American dream and how, for some people, particularly under the age of 30, it's not really attainable as it used to be for our parents and our grandparents. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. I think you look at the fact that one in six graduates right now from high school and college are likely to have no job, and that's unemployment uh, in general. And on top of that, they average about $25,000 in student loan debt and then are moving back home with their parents. That is a very bleak situation. And on top of that all, you have a, a generation who is facing uh, certainly an incredible hurdle in uh, personal debt from uh, being able to pay off their credit cards, personal debt from being able to pay rent, and so forth. So this is definitely generation debt. You know, it's a vicious cycle because when you leave college with so much debt and you move to a city where it's so, so expensive just to live, you live on your credit card, and so thus in the process, you really can't save, so you can't buy that first house. And by the way, that job that you just interviewed for and got is probably making $22,000, $23,000 a year. And so the question becomes, if I'm a young person, how do I get out of this? Where, where, where's my sense of hope? And just as importantly, who on the Republican side or who on the Democratic side is speaking for me? Well, there's a lack of advocates for young people in Congress. There's no doubt about that. And look at the age divide in Congress. First of all, the average age of a member of Congress is 59. The average senator, I think, is about 63. And so within that age gap becomes a lack of representation often for the needs of younger constituents. Now, younger constituents are also not uh, as engaged on legislation from a day-to-day -day basis. We have voted in the most, most recent elections, but uh, we definitely need to take ownership of conveying our problems more actively and, uh, and vociferously to our legislators so that they are considering us in the way they shape policy. Now, there are many great ideas we have, but we can get to some of those. Well, and we'll talk about <laughs> policy stuff in, in a few moments, but I want to talk about youth participation. We saw in 2008 with Barack Obama obviously being uh, at the top of the ticket on the Democratic side, record numbers of individuals coming out and saying, finally, someone looks like me, finally, someone is just as young as me, and finally, someone is speaking for me, I'm going to vote for this person. I'm not talking about John McCain, I'm talking about Barack Obama. Fast forward to today, there's a lot of apathy out there. I mean, I think you would agree with this, Matthew, is that some people are saying, you know what, that whole and change that we saw in 2008 is not the same here in 2012. In fact, in some ways, things are worse than they were yeah. in 2008. Where does this come from and how do you fix it? A couple of reasons for that. Well, one, we have a culture that's at odds with our politics. We live in a culture of high-speed internet, fast food, instant results for everything. And so when our generation is raised in that mobile, technologically oriented culture, and then they see a legislative process that takes a year or two to even pass a bill through committee, let alone through a chamber, let alone with bipartisan approval to then get it on the president's desk, it takes a while to create change. But don't you think and that's, the, but don't you think, not to interrupt, but don't you think that is the politician's uh, responsibility to manage expectations and the young person's responsibility to say, look, I know I have a short attention span. I know things are not going to happen in a nanosecond. So I have to make sure that I manage my own expectations because I know in Washington, D.C., things take some time to get done. I agree with both of your assessments. It's, it's up to both parties to manage expectations, but are certainly the politicians who want to make all kinds of lofty promises to get elected, and then inevitably they can't live up to those promises. But, you know, I think from our generation's perspective, uh, it is confusing that we can't even agree on seemingly the most obvious of things, uh, merely because we hold our elections and our parties sometimes above our national interests. I think our generation's really turned off by the hyper-partisanship. They're the turned policy. off by people putting party above country, and that's happening way too much. And that's why you see four out of ten young people not even identify with a political party anymore. They're saying, I don't believe in this binary system of either or. I choose neither. I worry about issues in particular that affect my life. I'm not worried about empowering some platform. Let's talk about issues that empower people's lives or that are infect people's lives. Let's talk about education. Sure. Um, you know, you touched upon individuals that um, are graduating college that are uh, deeply, deeply in debt. How do we fix the educational 
system um, here in this country where people feel like they are getting their money's worth, A, but also B, that parents, young parents, old parents, parents in general, feel like that the system is educating their kids at an efficient level? Well, there's a few different levels of education. There's K through 12, there's higher education. Our core constituency at ourtime.org is roughly 18 to 30, so I'll focus on higher education first. Higher education, you've seen 47 states cut funding on uh, higher education and public schools over the last several years. And if you look at the dollar, about 3%, 3 cents of what we send, uh, spend on every dollar goes to education. About 20 cents goes to Medicare and other health costs for seniors. About another 20 cents or more goes to the military. So if you look at uh, where we spend our dollars, and uh, there's the old saying, don't tell me what you value, show me your budget. We're not valuing investing in education. We often expect the individual to take on the burden of their own education in, in this country. In fact, and since tuition keeps rising and outpacing the cost of living by a landslide, it's becoming less attainable, which is also in tandem with the very American dream you referred to earlier in, in the fact, segment. In fact, many Fortune 500 CEOs will tell you the reason why we go over to China, the reason why we go over to India, the reason why we go outside of this country uh, to find qualified individuals is because we can't find qualified individuals in this country, A, to complete a, com a sentence, but also B, to compete in science and in math. I want to move on to healthcare. Uh, one could make the argument that if I'm 23 or 24 years old, I'm still in college, the healthcare program that was passed by the Congress a few years ago is a good thing for me. It's because I can stay on my parents' health care plan for another two, three, four years, depending on how old you are. But also, too, I'm guaranteed health care moving forward. Is this a good thing for young people? Is this a bad, or is this a bad thing for our overall system? Wildly popular for young people. I mean, two and a half million young people are now on their parents' insurance plans because of uh, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, obviously, when 50% of the bankruptcies in this country were from health care bills, and young people who are very healthy at a younger, by and large, at a younger stage in their life, don't often anticipate freak accidents or a sports injury or any kind of um, pain coming into their life that would necessitate an x ray or an MRI or very expensive medical costs. Now we have obviously a way of hedging against those costs coming into our life in an unanticipated way. This was one of the most wildly popular provisions of that bill and even Republicans have said who want to repeal Obamacare have said that they want to maintain the 26ers provision within the legislation. I want to move on to Social Security. Um, in our parents' generation, you put your money into the system. You knew that at the age of 62 or 65, three things possibly could happen. One, I would get a Social Security check from the federal government. Secondly, I would get some type of pension from my uh, job or organization. And thirdly, I would rely on my savings. That was the three-legged stool, if you will, that Franklin Roosevelt proposed back in 1933, and it worked pretty well for our grandparents. One can make the argument for our parents. Most statisticians, most economists, uh, even some young people would say that system, quite frankly, is going to go back bankrupt. That system is quite frankly not fair to a young person today who's going to live much, much young, uh, longer and who's probably going to have a much more efficient uh, work-life balance standpoint. Social Security, do you believe that Social Security for young people needs to be revamped? I think that young people, if you look at them, want a safety net. I think we also have to uh, potentially look into making tough solutions around retirement age. We might have to make tough solutions about um, ways that uh, we pay in less or more to the system to balance out uh, the numbers and to make it sustainable. But I'll leave that to the policymakers and to the statisticians to figure it out and to the actuaries and to everyone else who, who creates the numbers and, and, and who looks at facts, which is actually a key thing to pay attention to when we're determining our policy, not opinions. But what's most important is to clarify that young people want Social Security. If you look at polling, they want a safety net. They want to know that if they retire and if they give service to this country for 50, 60, 70 years, that in their last few years they can obviously rely on the support of uh, the country that they've given so much to. Last topic, I want to move on to 2012 politics. What I find so fascinating about 2012 and the Republicans, particularly Ron Paul, he is the oldest person in the race. He's still running for president of the United States. He is still someone that has said, I'm in this for the long haul. He is the oldest person running for the presidency. <laughs> But he has some of the youngest supporters, and when you go to his rallies, when you see him on television and so forth, they're the most enthusiastic. Why? 
Well, young people on the GOP side have liked Ron Paul because he epitomizes that candidate who's rather anti-establishment. He has unconventional views, obviously, on our debt, unconventional views on war, uh, very anti-war, unconventional views on the war on drugs, uh, very much pro legalization uh -huh. of, of the war on drugs and has viewed that as a failure, which it has disproportionately incarcerated young uh, minorities of, uh, in particular. And I think those types of views, which are not lockstep and barrel with an existing political party, are popular to a generation who's thinking more independently. Matthew, uh, it's pretty much a foregone conclusion that Barack Obama is going to be running against Mitt Romney in the fall. Who do you think squares up most for young people. In other words, my question is, is who speaks for young people? Um, or is there anyone, uh, uh, quite frankly, that does that on the Republican or Democratic side? I mean, that's going to have to obviously, first and foremost, come up to the decision of voter. the individual voter. But obviously, polling does show that young people are more supportive of Barack Obama. Many of his policies uh, have been popular. The one thing that my organization is pressuring both presidential candidates to do is to uh, create a national massive expansion of AmeriCorps and national service positions so that we can create a million new jobs so that every young person who wants to serve their country can have the opportunity to do so in all of these needed areas where there's a shortage like nursing, like teaching, like disaster relief, like advanced manufacturing and retrofitting, and we can go on and on and on. Ironically, with such large unemployment, there is so much that needs to get done, and we haven't matched workers to those needs. And there needs to be a major jobs program from either candidate, and it's an investment that's going to pay itself back many times over again, because look at the money we're spending on prison. Look at the money we're spending on food stamps. Look at the money we're spending on all these social welfare programs to take care of young people and all citizens because we haven't utilized their capacity. And we need something ambitious and bold to push for, and we're getting a million signatures on behalf of this National Youth Corps. Matthew, my last question for you is, as I said a few moments ago, 2008 was a banner year for, for young people coming out to vote. Do you think that's going to be uh, replicated in 2012? I think it's going to be a tougher year. There's, uh, uh, like you said, some expectations that need to be managed uh, this time around. And a lot of people did project uh, their wildest hopes and ambitions onto uh, the president. But I do think uh, if we do a good job and if the candidates invest the time and energy to talk to young voters, there will be a return on investment. Matthew Siegel, founder of Our Time, thank you for joining us for Comcast Newsmakers My on pleasure, the Vote. My pleasure, appreciate it. And of course, thank you for joining us for this edition of Comcast Newsmakers on the Vote. I'm Robert Trainum. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you next time. Take care.